So uh, thank you, Lawrence, and uh, we really appreciate your coming and enjoy it, and I'm happy to have you here. And I'm proud to be after uh, Marie Pierrevel uh, speaking. I hope it. I will not disappoint. So uh, I have a heavy subject: uh, lung cancer staging, the new TNM uh, system. There's a new edition. And we are going to learn about the 8th edition and uh, to review the main differences from the 7th edition, which was published in 2009, and uh, to discuss a little bit the limitations. Uh, unfortunately, lung cancer uh, continues to be the leading cause of cancer-related mortality worldwide. And uh, the aim of the TNM staging system used for lung cancer is to categorize similar disease extent uh, in order to accurately prognosticate the survival and to guide us for the best management. And uh, this system should be easy to implement, logical, unambiguous and reproducible. However, there is some limitations. So the new edition, the 8th edition, uh, was released in uh, January 2017 and in the United States it was implemented just now. And it was created by the International Association for the Study of Lung Cancer, who assembled a new global database of lung cancer patients over 10 years, the last uh, between uh, 1999 and 2010. And each descriptor, the tumor, lymph nodes, and metastasis were analyzed by complicated statistics in terms of survival. Uh, leading to validation of most of the known TNM staging, the seventh edition, and recommendations for a new, but uh, for very few new changes, but they are important and they are evidence based, and th this is what we are going to discuss mainly. So, what is the quality of the data? It was supposed to be prospective assembled data, however, uh, it's not like this. Actually, only less than 5% were uh, submitted in real time with the old tiny data about uh, genomics or PET, uh, CT avidity and all this. So uh, actually, it's a more a retrospective uh, registry, which is a limitation. And uh, uh, about the size, it's a, a uh, assembles of over 71,000 uh, lung cancer, not small lung cancer patients, which is the same size of the previous edition. However, in this edition, there are uh, much more Asians uh, who have a very early cancer, mostly subsolid adenocarcinoma, stage one, and the, uh, the European and North Americans are uh, less presented, which is a little bit of a problem because uh, they have most, uh, like us, the advanced stages uh, of lung cancer. So uh, the data here are mostly from patients who underwent surgery, 85% had surgery plus minus uh, chemo radio, while in real life, only about 20% of lung cancer patients uh, undergo resection uh, with the additional therapy. So uh, let's start describing the uh, components and we will start of course with the T, the tumor. Well this describes the measurements of the t primary tumor and its involvement in the adjacent structures. When there is an additional nodule, uh, the location of that nodule relative to the primary tumor, tumor will determine the T descriptor. And when there are multiple T descriptors, uh, that are applicable, applicable to the same tumor, we should use the highest one, the most uh, severe one. Uh, this time we were taught how to measure the tumor. Well, uh, for uh, all measurements, we should use the lung window setting with sharp filter and the measurements should be rounded to the millimeter. This is uh, important, of course, for uh, uh, small nodules. And uh, very interesting that while on the, uh, for the assessing nodule risk, like the Flushner guidelines, we need to, do, to give uh, the average between the long and the short uh, dimensions of the nodule. This is for the uh, rad lungs and Flushner society. But for tumor, for the TNA, we just provide one long axis dimension on lung uh, window. 
So we will start with the T1, and uh, you know that it's uh, lesions that are less than 3 cm. And now they are subcategorized into three different sizes. T1A is less than 1 cm, T1B between 1 and 2 cm, and T1C between 2 and 3 cm. Also, we have some new categorizations. The uh, in situ adenocarcinoma or squamous cell carcinoma in situ and minimally invasive adenocarcinoma, which I will discuss. In 2011, uh, new entities of adenocarcinoma, which replaced the former uh, uh, bone hole alveolar carcinoma, uh, were published. And these describe subsolid nodules. Uh, and uh, that look like this uh, diagrammatically. This is a pure ground glass nodule which uh, correspond, if it's uh, of less than three centimeters, to adenocarcinoma in situ. And where it, there is a subsolid nodule with a small uh, solid component of less than half a centimeter, this will be a minimally invasive adenocarcinoma. Now, very interestingly, in general, there is correlation between the ground glass uh, uh, component of the tumor on the CT and the lipidic pattern on histology, and also between the solid part and the invasive part on histology. Now, the invasive part, the size of the invasive part is the most important, and it's a better predictor for prog prognosis for the survival than the size of the whole nodule. So here we have to measure the nodules differently and I will show it to you. So how do we measure a subsolid nodule? We should look for the solid component because as I said, this is the most important for prognosis. And uh, we can also record the, the, uh, the whole nodule size, including the gown glass. But again, the, here as in, in this example, you see a four millimeter solid component, 18 millimeters ground glass opacity. So this uh, qualifies for minimally invasive adenocarcinoma because the solid component is of less than five millimeter and the whole nodule is less than three, uh, three centimeters. Here we see an example of pure ground glass lesion, which was uh, resected by segmentectomy. Uh, the prognosis is uh, wonderful, almost 100% survival. This is adenocarcinoma in situ. And here we have another example of minimally invasive adenocarcinoma. Uh, the solid component of less than 5 millimeter and the whole nodule of 1.1 uh, centimeter. As I said, T1A are also lesions of less than centimeter if they are solid, and also if they are endobronchial and not in the main bronchi, it's a T1 lesion. Here we have again examples of size. This is a 1.2 centimeter lesion, so this is a T1B, and here we have a T1C, 2.6 centimeters T1 lesion. This one is more complicated because we see here a subsolid nodule. Well, what T should be uh, corresponding for that? The solid component is of 1.3 centimeters, so I don't measure the whole nodule, which was even uh, 3 centimeters. And this is a T1B because the solid component is between 1 and 2 centimeters. Let's uh, continue with the T2. So the size, um, again, but this time the classification of size is limited to five centimeters. So only three to four centimeters are T2A and T2B is four to five centimeters and above uh, that we will have a T3 lesion. Lesions that invade the visceral pleura are uh, T2 lesions. And also, it was found that even central lesions that are endobronchial, if they do not involve the carina, can be T2 lesions, even if there is atelectasis or pneumonitis of the whole lung. So let us see some examples. Here we have size uh, component, 3.2 centimeters. So this is a T2A. And here we have a T2B lesion, which also attaches the visceral pleura. Here we have a nice example, you see 
a very typical chest x-ray of a central lesion with a collapse of the right upper lobe. Uh, probably you should remember the classic uh, radiological sign, the S sign of golden. Actually, uh, the S is inverted. So a, a central obstructing lesion with upper lobe collapse is the uh, S sign of golden, creating this S by the uh, uh, shift of the fissure. And here we see the tumor itself, it's close to the carina, but not involving it, causing a atelectasis of the whole lung, and this is a T2 lesion. And another central T2 lesion, atelectasis of the whole lung, was still a small one, so it's T2. Let's continue with T3. So now again, the size, 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 and size, five to seven centimeters are T3 lesions. And also T3 lesions invade the chest wall, the parietal pericardium. And if it is a pancost which does not involve, involve the cervical nerve roots, it will be a T3 lesion. Another uh, uh, possibility is having another tumor nodule or a satellite in the same lobe. And this is of the primary tumor. And this is also a T3 lesion. Let's see some examples. So by size, 5.5 centimeters, T3 lesion. And here we have a, a recent a, a case where we see a pancost tumor, which was involving only nerve roots T1 and T2. So this qualifies for a T3 pancost tumor. You probably notice um, by these arrows that there is a, a rib destruction here due to this uh, tumor which uh, invaded the chest wall. So chest wall invasion and of course invasion of the parietal pleura are also T3 and chest wall invasion does not preclude the patient from surgery. Here we see a relatively uh, small tumor of 2.9 centimeters. So by size we could say that this is maybe a T1C but we see that it's involving the stranding in the parietal pericardium fat, so it's invading the parietal pericardium, so this is a T3 lesion. So every time that we have one of the descriptors that is more severe, we should take this one. And what happens if there are multiple pulmonary nodules? So as we mentioned, when there is a few other nodules with, within the same lobe, this is a T3 lesion. When there are tumor nodules in the ipsilateral lung and different lobe, this will be T4. This is the same as the uh, current system. And another lesion, which is on the contralateral lung, will be already metastatic intrathoracic M1A. An example, we have here the primary tumor and two more lesions in the same lobe. So this should be T3 lesion. We are continuing with the most severe disease, T4, which is usually non-resectable because it invades the mediastinum, the heart or the great vessels, the trachea or the carina, the esophagus or spine. As I mentioned, the nodule within the same lung in the different lobe. And the new Size, again, size, seven centimeter mass is a T4 lesion by its prognosis, very bad prognosis. Diaphragmatic invasion, also bad prognosis. It was previously T3, now it's a T4 lesion. And Falcon tumor, which is non-resectable because it involves the brachial plexus, the subclavian vessels, uh, should be a T4 lesion. So here we have an example of a huge tumor mass. This is a T4. And another mass that invades the diaphragm, again, reclassified to T4. Invasions of the mediastinal vessels, as we see here, superior vena cava is also a T4. Invasion of the trachea. Here there was suspicion for invasion of the esophagus, uh, confirmed at surgery. And another example of a large tumor obstructing the superior vena cava, invading the right atrium, also invading the vessels 
that are intrapericardial, so this is also qualifies for T4. Uh, here there was a aortic invasion also confirmed at surgery, which we can see here on the coronal view, and another nodule in a different lobe, again a T4. And severe chest wall invasion with invasion of the vertebra or cardiac severe invasion, all are non resectable T4 lesions. Sometimes when there is a minor or up to even a 50% uh, invasion of the vertebral body, some may reject it. And this is a bad pancos that we encountered uh, recently. You see here invasion of a few vertebra, it was actually T1, T2, and T3, and encircling the subclavian artery, the invasion of the vertebra, and the brachial plexus. So this is an unresectable pancos tumor. And this is a squamous cell carcinoma, a cavitary large lesion with another nodule in a different lobe, a T4 lesion. So when I summarize the T's, you have noticed that each centimeter counts for prognosis. We stop by each centimeter and there is a descriptor in a, every one of them. T2 endobronchially is, has somewhat better prognosis, was a, a downgraded to T2. Also, if there is a telectasis, diaphragmatic invasion is bad, T4, and we can see here in the Kaplan survival curves, you see the, those are the T designations. So each one of these curves is a completely different from the other one. The split is good, meaning that the, the data is very a highly reflective of the prognosis of each one of T descriptors, while we are talking here about a T1 to 4, N0, M0, and fully resected tumors. So it's really reflecting prognosis, the new T categories, and uh, previously the T3 and T4 had uh, the same categories on the Kaplan survival curves. Now for the lymph nodes, uh, intrathoracic lymph nodes, well I just uh, showed the uh, 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 mention that uh, lymph nodes uh, are measured in their short axis while the primary tumor should be measured in its long axis. And there is no change in the descriptors, so we are happy. The uh, survival curves are uh, well differentiated and we remember that the uh, N1 disease is when the ipsilateral uh, hilar lymph nodes are involved. N2 is when the ipsilateral mediastinal or subcarinal lymph nodes are involved, and N3 when the contralateral mediastinal uh, or hilar uh, lymph nodes are involved, or the same side or contralateral supracalvicular scaleni or lower thoracic. And here you can see an example of a tumor in the right upper lobe and right paratracheal lymph node which is enlarged, and this is a T2 disease. We should uh, describe and report the lymph nodes according to a lymph node map which was published in 2009 and I encourage you to look at this publication. It's not easy to use it and uh, there are some uh, ambiguities and some uh, details that are missing and uh, for myself even I use this uh, uh, application, you can uh, uh, download it in uh, uh, the App Store, Thoracic Lymph Node Map, and scroll and see the names of each uh, station, which is very helpful, and also how to sample them. It was found, and it's known from all other cancers, that the number of the involved lymph nodes is very important for the prognosis. Uh, however, we are not required to uh, report that on the clinical staging, which is the imaging, but the pathology uh, should uh, report this. And also it was found that when there are skip metastases, meaning that uh, there are uh, N2 disease but no N1 disease, this has the same prognosis as multiple lymph node stations in N1 disease. When we report the lymph nodes uh, by the CT, we are very, very limited. We, lose, we use the one centimeter in short axis dimension, 
And it's clear that size criteria is not good enough to assess uh, tumor invasion. So the sensitivity of CT is only 57%, while the specificity is 82%. And PET, does, PET CT does better job with a sensitivity of 80%. So still, micrometastasis can be missed by PET-CT, which are uh, revealed during the surgery, and the specificity is around 90%. PET-CT can also provide a nice roadmap for lymph nodal staging uh, to be used. And now I'm with the uh, metastatic component. So previously, we had only M1A for intrathoracic and M1B for extrathoracic metastasis. And now we have three different descriptors. M1A will be for intrathoracic metastasis, including malignant pleural and pericardial nodules or effusion and contralateral pulmonary nodules. And we have a new one. M1B now is a single extrathoracic lesion in a single organ. And actually, it has the same prognosis as M1A disease. And the worst case is, of course, multiple extrathoracic metastasis. So here we have a large tumor with uh, nodules in the pleura and another nodule on the contralateral lung, so this is M1A. And here we have a tumor in the right upper lobe, and only a single metastasis extrathoracic in a single organ, this is the adrenal metastasis, so this qualifies, qualifies for the new M1B descriptor. If we are talking about the adrenals, this is a common site for metastasis and they present in about 20% of patients with non-small lung cancer at presentation. However, we all know that benign adrenal muscles are very common incidental finding and actually in the absence of other extrathoracic metastasis, if a lung cancer patient has an adrenal mass, it is more likely that it is a benign lesion. And uh, we can uh, easily uh, identify that by doing a non-contrast enhanced CT. And if the attenuation is less than 10 Hauzfeld units, uh, the specificity is very high for benignity. But uh, unfortunately, uh, around 30% are uh, non-lipid rich adenomas. And then we will need to use the MRI or PET or even a biopsy. Uh, to uh, exclude uh, metastasis. And this patient had uh, a large tumor and the uh, metastasis in the bones, subcutaneous tissues, and adrenals. So this is M1C, multiple metastasis in one or more uh, or several organs. What happens if there are multiple cancers in the same patients or multiple lesions, I would say? So this is a complicated case. We should uh, discuss it in the, the multidisciplinary tumor board. And uh, if we can get the histology of the two lesions, it would be the best. Uh, it's very easy if the histology is different, like one side squamous cell carcinoma and uh, the other one uh, adenocarcinoma. So we should use a different TNM for each one of them. And if there are uh, separate nodules of the same histology, is the uh, explanation that the description that I just gave before, we have the options according to the location of the satellite nodule, T3, T4, or M1A. But now we have also the multiple adenos with the ground glass opacities or lipidic histologic features. And for that, we should describe the one that has the highest T descriptor uh, and the number of lesion in par parentheses, and then give one N and M descriptors. So here we have an example. This one was a minimally invasive adenocarcinoma. And here we had a small ground glass opacity, which is likely adenocarcinoma in situ. It was nine millimeters. So this uh, uh, qualifies for a T1 minimally invasive, two lesions, N0 and M0, and the prognosis is usually good. A rare uh, pneumonic type 
uh, of cancer, uh, which look uh, like uh, pneumonia, uh, can happen. And in this case, we will describe uh, uh, T3 when it involves, involves one lobe, and the T4 if it's two lobes, and M1A if it's on the other side as well. What do we see here? This is a carcinoma, and what is this? I have another picture. So here we see lymphangitic spread or lymphangitic carcinomatosis. Uh, it's a characteristically uh, inter uh, lobular septal thickening, which could be nodular and uh, peribronchial uh, uh, thickening. And there's no uh, uh, specific descriptor of this. We know that it has a poor prognosis, and uh, usually it has also, the patient has pleural effusions, and I think it should have the M1A as a descriptor, but it was not mentioned in the uh, TNM uh, guidelines. Stage grouping uh, must be uh, very confusing now because we have so many options. So uh, let's just uh, uh, go uh, with it. Now we have the T1, A, B and C. So it will be with stage 1, A1, 1, A2 and 1, A3 when there are no nodal metastases. And the small T2, A is stage 1, B with no nodes. And then for N1 disease and the small tumors, it's stage 2B. And for the larger ones, it's a stage 3A already. N2 disease, of course, will be a stage um, a, a 3A. For N3 disease a, and larger tumors will be 3B already, so poor prognosis. For N3 disease, again, 3B. And a new descriptors, if the patient has T3 or T4 and N3 disease, this is a new stage, 3C. It's really almost as bad as metastatic disease. And then for the metastatic disease, uh, as I mentioned, the single uh, metastasis in a single extrathoracic uh, organ is M1B, and it has the same prognosis as intrathoracic metastasis. So those are, are all stage 4A, and extrathoracic metastasis are stage 4B. Let's practice a little bit. Here we have a large tumor which might be invading the chest wall, uh, the parietal pleura for sure is involved. And then we have here those lower cervical nodes and contralateral uh, mediastinal paratracheal nodes. So what is the staging? The tumor is T3, it's less than seven centimeters invading the parietal pleura. The disease is N3, we have here the uh, lower cervical nodes, and in case it's an M0 disease, we have stage 3C. And now for Kahoot, uh, it did. Okay. okay. So each one, if you take up your cell phones, go into Kahoot. Go to Google, write Kahoot. And this is a challenging practice, but also we have a quiz after that, so we can log on now. So just go on Google to Kahoot. Do not put the pin in. This is not the right pin. This is not the right pin. Okay. <laughs> this is the right pin, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, you need to put a nickname. You just go in, you go to Kahoot, and it'll ask you to put your nickname. You can put your own name, you can put a funny name, like Purple Heart or whatever you want. And the pink lady. <laughs> Wait, do we need to download first? No, no. You just enter it. Enter the location, the site. Okay, and the pin is excellent. You excellent. see how many players you have? Yes, yes, of course, of course. Go, go. <laughs> more, more. We are stuck. Okay.
No more? No more? Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> now when we're done, keep, keep staying in, okay? We're going to wait a few more seconds and we're going to go to the first question. Yeah, just don't close it after this Yes, keep question. it because we'll have it for the rest of the day. Full screen, no? Full screen, yeah. Uh -oh. Okay. Okay, we have it. So um, we don't have the presentation now, but I will uh, uh, just uh, shortly introduce the patient. We had a patient who presented with a. a oh, okay. So we have to go back. Just a second. Okay. No, 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 go back. Yes, sure. Sure. No, I don't think you can go back. I can't stop it. You s it, that's it. Th that's that they had 20 seconds and they voted. But they didn't uh, present it. Okay. <laughs> here you okay. go. Okay. So, uh, mom, 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 we will uh, practice that. <laughs> so this is a, a patient who was uh, who presented with a single brain metastasis. Uh, uh, we diagnosed squamous cell carcinoma. You see the cavitary lesion. Uh, in the right upper lobe, and there was additional tumor nodule. You can see that it was pet avid, no lymph nodes. And my, my question was, what is the patient's TNM? Okay, so you should look for T and M. <coughs> now, uh, let's go back to the Kahoot. Let's go back. Uh, okay. Here, so most of the people got it right. So, the audience, the audience did well. <laughs> the audience did well? Yes. Ah, okay. So, uh, yeah, the correct is uh, T3 and 0 M1B because we had a single extra thoracic metastasis in a single organ and then we had a satellite nodule in the same lobe and the uh, 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 five centimeter lesion or six centimeter lesion. Okay, so I'll continue. I'm about to finish. Okay. So shortly, limitations of this uh, uh, database is that it's a retrospective. We didn't have even the eGFR mutations, though there were so many Asians who have this mutation. The data was not submitted. And uh, also uh, patients with more advanced disease were lacking. Uh, the lymph node map is ambiguous and the, the radiologists and also the other disciplines failed to apply it in daily practice, unfortunately. And I think for us, for radiologists, uh, imaging uh, of the anatomy, especially for CT, is very limited in the assessment of tumor invasion and nodal involvement. So this is our limitation when we try to uh, apply it. Uh, the prognosis depends on tumor expand, uh, extent, but also on many other factors related to the patient, uh, like his performance status, if there are competing reasons for death, the tumor itself, the genome, the pet avidity, the grade, the access to care, and what treatment he received. So I think there is a strong need for a prognostic prediction model which will take into account all these factors and on, not only like the TNM, the anatomic description of the disease. So in summary, we saw that the new staging system better differentiates tumor based on prognosis with emphasis on tumor size and single versus multiple extrathoracic metastasis. Uh, there are a huge amount of other factors affecting prognosis which should be incorporated in making the most appropriate decisions for the particular patient and we as clinicians should take all these complex data into our decision. Thank you.